you how it is and, and can be done. But first, I just want to um, you know sort of set some context for the remarks today. It is definitely a problem uh, finding and buying the right used cars for the right money. There's no question about it. I was recently told by a friend who tends to be a reliable source that he had heard from uh, an executive of the Odessa auto auction that um, outside the United States there are 180 countries that are registered to buy cars in that auction system. And in that 180 countries outside the U.S. there are 3,000 individuals who are registered. And I'm told that this year 64% of the dealer consignment cars that have been sold in that auction system have been sold to buyers outside the United States. And if you really stop and think about that, that's, that's an incredible and amazing statistic. And um, you know, it really raises the question, you know, who are we competing against in the auction? I would think it's probably pretty safe to assume that you know, most of those other non-US countries don't have retail markets that are as efficient as ours. And consequently, you know, perhaps the sky's the limit to what they can get for these cars in the retail marketplace. I mean, it just might be like the U.S. was 50 years ago, more or less the wild, wild west. So, you know, I, I don't know that um, these uh, international buyers just can't afford to pay whatever they need to pay, you know, and still be okay with these cars. So, you know, it's definitely a changing landscape and uh, one, that, uh, one that's affecting us profoundly and, and creating a lot of pain and confusion. But what I'm going to share with you today is a three-step technique that I've come to understand uh, to allow you the opportunity to actually buy the right used cars for the right money, find, buy, find and buy them for the right money. But you know, let me just say for sure, um, for a very long time when it came to sourcing used cars, we never really knew how good we had it. Um, you know, when this market sold 14, 15, 16 million used cars, uh, we basically stood on our used car lot and people threw trades at us. And when they didn't throw enough of the right trades at us, we went to the auction marketplace and there was an abundance of cars being presented to us by, you know, fleet and lease and rent a car and corporate fleets and manufacturers. So, you know, really if we're honest with ourselves, how good did we have to be to buy cars in days gone by? All we had to do is have a checkbook and show up either at our lot or at the auctions with some common sense and we're able to buy cars. But, you know, those uh, primary means of sourcing cars have been largely restricted with the fewer number of retail new cars and we all understand, you know, that those corporate uh, turnbacks have been significantly curtailed. And as if all of that wasn't harsh enough, at the same time, we've had this condition now for the past 24 months where wholesale prices have been rising precipitously and they've been rising at a pace much faster than the retail price has uh, risen. So what we all find ourselves in is a highly, highly compressed margin environment. I quite frankly can't remember a time in my career where there's so little margin between what we have to pay for these vehicles wholesale and what we can uh, uh, retail them for. So you add up all of these uh, factors together and it creates an understandable perception that you can't buy the right cars for the right money. So while I understand that perception for those reasons, I also have come to understand that it is absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. Um, there's hardly a day of the week that goes by that I don't uh, demonstrate what I'm about to show all of you. And, and that is that a guy who can't see very well can show up in just about any market and using a certain technique and using some technology, what we can do is we can find the hottest used cars, as we'll do here, and demonstrate that they can be purchased for the right money. But for sure, it requires a different strategy. Now, I'm going to talk about the new strategy, but let me first make a few remarks on the old strategy that we all knew. It's what I would call happenstance inventory. Happenstance inventory. What happens to get traded in that we like and consider to be retail, and what we happen to be able to buy at today's local auction for what we think is the right money. That's what I refer to as happenstance inventory. And once again, if we're honest with ourselves, I think that we would all have to agree that for the most part, the vehicles on our used car lots um, represented vehicles sourced in those two means, you know, which are fairly, you know, happenstance uh, circumstances. 
And we like happenstance inventory. Let's make no bones about it. We like it. Why? Well, it's the way we've always done it. It's familiar. Uh, it's relatively easy, or at least it has been relatively easy uh, up to this time, and, and it's just in our zone of comfort. So, you know, that is happenstance inventory. And, and what I'm going to introduce to you is a different strategy for stocking a lot called engineered inventory. Engineered inventory, where you're actually strategically identifying and sourcing vehicles to go on that used car lot that are going to sell fast and, importantly, be able to purchase for the right money. So the problem, however, with strategic inventory sourcing or engineered inventory uh, strategy is that it takes a lot more work and it takes more time. And it often takes skills and technology or tools that many dealers uh, or used car you know, managers don't have or, quite frankly, maybe don't want to have. So I'm not here to tell you that what I'm about to show you is going to be a natural for everyone. But, you know, I'm also not here to tell you that the used car business is easier than it used to be. It's harder. But if you are willing to invest the time to learn, invest the time to do, um, as I'll demonstrate, it, it can be done. But for sure, it's something that, uh, while it might make sense to all of you, it will not be adopted, I can assure you, by the mass industry. But where it's being done, it works. So the specific type of engineered inventory that I want to introduce to you today is a particular engineered strategy that I call free agency. Now, free agency is the belief that today, with certain limitations, with certain limitations, any dealer can sell any hot used car off of their lot. That's the premise of free agency. Now, free agency engineered stocking is a very beautiful thing if it's done right because it has two very important uh, benefits. The first is, as I'll demonstrate here shortly, that you can find and buy the hottest used cars for the right money in the market. That's a pretty strong benefit, but as if that wasn't enough, it will also very significantly increase the number of used retail units and gross profit off of any lot that does it right. So those are two pretty uh, significant benefits, ability to buy the right cars for the right money and increase your volume and gross profit. So, you know, with those two potential rewards, I think it's, uh, you know, definitely worthy of consideration uh, on everyone's part to learn it and attempt to use it properly. But doing free agency strategic stocking properly has a certain discipline that must be adhered to. And specifically, there are three steps, uh, each one I'll demonstrate, uh, that have to be followed. And the first step is that you have to be willing to expand the consideration set of vehicles that you would possibly stock. You have to expand the consideration set beyond those which represent the brand of your franchise. You have to be willing to expand the consideration set beyond those vehicles that you've had favorable past sales history with. And, you know, those are often not easy things to do because all of us are creatures of comfort and safety. And to a certain extent, uh, going out beyond our, our limits of familiarity introduces some real risk and some discomfort. So, you know, the, the first step is uh, not to be understated in terms of its challenge, and that is to step out of the bow step out of the boundaries, step out of the box of our familiarity. The second step, as I'll demonstrate, um, is counterintuitive as it may be, is that I'm going to ask you to consider those vehicles that are least obvious to you as the right cars. And the reason that I would suggest you to do that as the second step is that if you're going to chase the same cars that are obviously hot to every other used car manager in town, good luck. It's going to be really tough on you. But as I'll demonstrate, there are always cars in every market that are hot in terms of the consumer market and not quite so obvious to every other used car manager in town. And that doesn't necessarily mean that those vehicles are going to be easy to buy, but very often they are going to be easier to buy for the right money than the ones that are obviously hot to everyone. 
And then the third step of free agency that we'll demonstrate is knowing better in a different manner how to determine what you can afford to pay for any given vehicle in your market. So those are the three steps. If you stick to the three steps, um, the likelihood of success with strategic free agency stocking is very high. It will never be 100%, but uh, for that matter, nothing will. So let me now uh, begin the, the demonstration of how to do each one of these three steps. And I've uh, garnered the permission of a dealership that I've come to know and have a very high degree of respect for. It's a uh, small dealership group of about five dealerships in northern Michigan. The name of the dealership group is called Bill Marsh Group. I've spoken about these guys in the past. Many of you have uh, seen or heard me do that. Some of you might know them. They have an extremely competent management team. Uh, they're used car operation led by a gentleman by the name of Russ Wallace. And um, I have at the controls here today with me my assistant, Susan. I think many of you know that I'm vision impaired, so Susan's going to be helping me uh, with the data on the screen. So, Susan, are we at the home page at the enterprise level of the Bill Marsh Group? Yes, we are. Okay, so what we're viewing here is the used vehicle inventory across uh, about five locations that they operate. And I believe that the um, franchises that they have across these five uh, locations, one is a Buick GMC, another one is a Chrysler, another one is a Hyundai, they have an independent used car operation called Price Point, and then they recently have acquired a Ford store. So you're looking at their used vehicle inventory profile uh, in their V Auto system rolled up at an enterprise level as if it was one big bucket of used vehicles. And I believe that they have their pricing buckets broken up into 10-day increments. Is that right, Susan? That's correct. And could you read to me, please, the uh, percentage of market of their pricing in each one of the first three or four buckets? Certainly. That would be 96%, uh -huh. 95%, uh, 95%, and 94%. Okay. So what that represents is an indication that after, in the first 10 days, I should say, their average price is 96% of average money for those cars in that market. So in other words, the cars that they have for the first 10 days for sale are priced on average 4% below the average price of the identically equipped competing vehicle. And then you see how it drops to a 5% uh, competitive advantage and then to a 6%. So their average price point is 95%. And Susan, what is their average markup? And this is something that I think is really important for everyone to uh, make observation of. Their average markup, having priced their cars on average 5% below the average price of the identically equipped competing vehicles, what, Sue? $1,500. So that's a $1,500 markup, okay? Now, that may not overly impress a whole lot of traditional dealers who are used to pricing their vehicles at, you know, three, four $4,000 markups in the first 30 days or so. But I can tell you uh, that this dealership has absolute phenomenal used car profit success, evidenced by what you're about to see on the next page. And Susan, show, um, uh, show us, please, how many retail turns this dealership is achieving across five dealerships in northern Michigan, where I might add it's quite cold. 15.5 turns. 15 and a half retail turns. So you might not be impressed with what you would imagine their average gross profit to be, but at the end of the day, when they take their deposit to the bank, having made 15 and a half turns retail per year, uh, needless to say, it's a sizable quantity of profit that they generate at the store, but they don't do it using the traditional dealer strategy of trying to maximize their average gross profit. They do it with the velocity method of, of management, which is to maximize the number of retail turns, because keep in mind, although they might make a lower front end gross profit on every sale, they put many more vehicles through their service department and many more customers through their F&I offices. So in totality, the result is much greater than if they were to strive for a very high average gross profit, as most traditional dealers do. But that aside, let's go back to that vehicle summary page. I want to make another very important observation that will become relevant here in a moment. And I want to point out, what is the average, Susan, market day supply? What's the average market, market day supply? Not dealership day supply, but the average supply of their vehicles in their market uh, is what? 86. 
six. So the reason I bring that to everyone's attention is as we move forward into these three steps now of free agency stocking, to be sure my objective will be to place cars on that used car lot that will lower that market day supply. Why? Because the lower you can drive down the market day supply of your inventory, the lower cost of acquiring the sale and the less sensitive to price competition such vehicles will be. So the key uh, here is to find cars that will actually lower that average. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to demonstrate how technology can read the uh, northern Michigan market live in real time and, and juxtapose that or overlay it against the inventory of this particular dealership group. So go ahead and optimize their inventory, Sue. Okay, we're all set. Okay. Now the blue bars on the screen represent Marsh's inventory as it exists across their five lots right now. The gold line represents the sales of vehicles by segment in the northern Michigan market uh, in the last 45 days up to the last second. Now what you can see here is an obvious strategic uh, design on their part to stock vehicles of, of a nature that are going to sell well in the months of December and January in northern Michigan. You see a high, high concentration of vehicles in the uh, SUV and truck category relative to the car category. So Susan, give me an example. Let's say in the intermediate SUV category, what percent of their inventory is there versus what percent of the market sales? Currently in inventory is 17%. Market is selling at 12%. Okay, so does everyone understand that? 17% of the vehicles in their inventory right now are, um, are S intermediate SUVs, 12%. But yet in the past, I'm sorry, 17%. But yet in the last 45 days, 12% of the sales in their market have been intermediate SUVs. And if you stop and think about it, that would probably make some sense because, you know, October, November uh, probably are not the same SUV sales type months that they're anticipating December, January to be. So they're ahead, purposely ahead of the curve there a bit. But contrast that to, let's say, intermediate cars. Susan, what percent of their inventory currently on the across these five lots are intermediate vehicles versus sales in this market? And for intermediate cars in in their inventory is seventeen percent. Huh? Market is selling at twenty eight. Okay. Now that's you know, that's sort of a significant gap. Um, but I you know, I'm not hugely concerned about it because I would guess that as the snow flies in northern Michigan probably the number of sales will shift away from intermediate cars towards those four-wheel drive SUVs. But still, you know, there is a fairly significant gap between what they're stocking and what the market is demanding in this particular category of intermediate vehicles. So perhaps one could begin the process of engineered inventory and more specifically free agency inventory with an assumption that if this dealership had a few more, a few more of the right intermediate vehicles on their lot, intermediate cars to be more specific, that they might pick up some incremental sales. So if you're all willing to give me at least that as a possibility, then the next question would be, okay, what price class of intermediate cars does Northern Michigan like the best? So we can now see a price distribution. And Susan, tell us how that looks, please. Right now, the uh, Michigan area uh, is tied between the fifteen to uh, ten to fifteen thousand dollar mark and the fifteen to twenty thousand dollar mark. Okay, so the sales in the past forty five days in those two price categories is roughly the same. How does that contrast with the present balance of inventory of their intermediate car segment? Right now, in inventory in the ten to fifteen thousand uh, dollar mark market, they have uh, seventy one percent of their inventory. Okay. And in the fifteen to twenty thousand dollars, they only have ten percent, and the market is selling at thirty. Wow. Okay. So I mean, that's really interesting. I mean, obviously, we all like inexpensive cars. However, you know, um, in northern Michigan, at least in the past forty-five days, fifteen to twenty is a rival category of sales. To be clear, with ten to fifteen, but yet, as you can see, the preponderance of Marsh's intermediate vehicle inventories in that lower 
10 to 15,000 on our price category. So one could perhaps posit the belief that they are missing some opportunities for intermediate car sales, specifically in that 15 to 20,000 dollar category. And if you're with me up to that point, then the next logical question is, okay, which ones? What would be the very best 15 to 20,000 dollar used cars that you could possibly have on your lot right now if you were a dealer in northern Michigan. Now, interestingly, what does the word best mean? You know, to some dealers, best cars are ones that sell in really high volume. But what if I also told you that they had high supply? A vehicle that sells in high volume in your market but also has very high supply is likely going to be a very, very price sensitive car. A car that you're going to have to be very careful about what you pay for and a car that you're going to have to be very careful about how you price. Alternatively, best car to have could have a different meaning, and on the opposite end of the spectrum, it could be one that is least sensitive to price competition. Now, what characteristics of a vehicle in a market would cause it to be least sensitive to price competition? Well, if you follow the theory of rational economics, it would be the car or the product that has the highest demand and least supply. So the technology has or gives, provides you the ability to set a stocking objective bar anywhere between one to five. If you set it at one, it would in fact show you the vehicles that have the highest volume. Often they'll be accompanied by also the highest supply. Alternatively, you could set that stocking bar at five, or for that matter, anywhere in between. And if you did set it at five, which I'm going to ask Susan to do, what it's going to do is it's going to show us the fifteen to $20,000 intermediate cars right now in northern Michigan that have that most special characteristic of best that is defined as low market day supply or high demand short supply. So what I'm doing right now for you is step one of the three steps that I previously outlined of free agency stocking is I'm developing a list of vehicles for this particular dealership group in their market of northern Michigan of vehicles that represent um, high demand, low supply, best vehicles that match up or align with opportunity in their inventory that we previously identified. That's fifteen to twenty thousand dollar intermediate cars. So Sue, tell me what this list looks like. Uh, first vehicle is an 07 Honda Accord. And tell me, why is that 07 Honda Accord at the top of the list? Currently it has 48 available. Uh -huh. It has sold 44 in the last 45 days and the market day supply is 49. 49. Now, if you all recall a few moments ago when we looked at the Marsh inventory, I asked you to make mental note of what is their market day supply. Their market day supply, the inventory they have on their lot right now is in the mid 80s. So to the extent that we can possibly get some of these cars on their lot, what we will in fact be doing is lowering their market day supply, which will, do, which will in turn reduce their cost of acquiring the sale and uh, make the vehicle less sensitive to price competition. So what comes after that uh, Honda Accord, Susan? The 09 Toyota Camry. And keep going. Uh, 10, the 2010 Toyota Camry. Uh -huh. The 2008 Chrysler 300. Hmm, that's an interesting car. The 2008 Toyota Camry. Uh -huh. The 2010 Dodge Charger. Uh -huh. uh, 2010 Dodge Avenger. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a 2010 Pontiac G6. Mm -hmm. uh, 2010 Chrysler Sebring. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, 2009 Ford Fusion. Uh -huh. A 2008 Buick Lucerne. Uh -huh. A 2009 Chevy Malibu. Okay. A 2007 Dodge Charger. Okay. A 2009 Dodge Charger. Okay. A 2010 Chevy Impala. Okay. And a okay. uh, 07 Buick Lucerne. Okay. Now, if you recall, I said that free agency has a couple of practical limitations. In other words, this theory that any dealer can sell any hot used car off of their lot very efficiently has a couple of limitations. Let me explain why today it is the case that any dealer can sell any hot used car off of their lot regardless of its brand, subject to a couple of limitations that I'll touch on in a moment. Because, you know, it used to be that if you were a Buick's GMC dealer, for example, 
and you happen to have a vehicle on your lot that just happened to be very hot in your market, let's assume it was a Nissan Murano, and in the past, if you were in possession of that hot Nissan Murano, the only chance that you would have had of selling that vehicle is if you had switched somebody from another car, which is possible, or you had run a liner ad on that vehicle, which is also a possible uh, way to have sold that car. However, neither one of those is particularly efficient enough to justify going out and buying Nissan Murano's if you happen to be a Buick GMC store. But today, what we know is that the way that people shop is that before they leave their home, what they're going to do is they're going to go to the internet, they're going to go to a destination shopping site like a cars.com or an auto trader, they're going to type in their zip code, and they're going to type in the type of car that they want to buy. And you have to really understand and respect the fact that that search engine doesn't care if you were a Buick GMC dealer, if you happen to have that hot Nissan Murano, which is being frequently searched for. Yours comes up more or less right there along with all of the other ones, just like yours. So you see, that is a really important gift that the Internet has given the automobile dealer. Today, it becomes very efficient, very realistic for a dealer to stock cars that go beyond their franchise brand that go beyond the vehicles that you know they may have had past sales history with. It allows you to leverage that square footage that you call used car operations against a much bigger, broader segment of, of types of vehicles that might happen to be in demand in your market. Now, having said that, there are a couple of practical limitations. And one such practical limitation really jumps out from looking at this page of cars, and it's this that there are a few makes, but I really stress a few makes of vehicles that have a particularly high degree of customer loyalty to their certified brand. Um, I call them breeder cars. People want to tend to want to buy these types of vehicles from the breeder. And two vehicles that I've come to understand to be particularly you know, prone to this breeder phenomenon, as I refer to it, are Toyotas and Hondas. So even if it is the case, and it happens to be, that some of the hottest vehicles in northern Michigan right now in this very interesting segment of ten to fifteen to $20,000 intermediate cars happens to be Toyota and Honda, I don't really encourage a dealership that doesn't represent those brands, doesn't have the ability to certify them, to play in that market. I'm not saying that it can't be done. I have seen it done. But it is often the case that you'll encounter some headwinds trying to sell those types of cars you know, that are certifiable to the marketplace, even if they are hungry for them, without the ability to put the factory certification. Not impossible, just a, a prudent, practical uh, limitation to be cautious of. Another practical limitation of the free agency theory of stocking is that there's no question that the brand or the franchise that you represent does create a brand identity for your store in the marketplace. So to give you a very extreme example, let's assume that you were a Jaguar dealer. And let's further assume that in your market of northern Michigan, it just happened to be the case that four-wheel drive quad cab pickup trucks were very hot. I'm not sure I'd want to have a discussion with you about turning your luxury import lot into a truck center. But I will tell you that some dealers have done it. And I've had, you know, I've seen it done with some success, but again, it's not, uh, it, it's not, you know, what I would generally recommend to dealers in mass, because, you know, I would, I would think that there is a certain amount of natural traffic you have that is largely de are, um, sort of um, determined by your brand image of what your new car franchise is. So I, I think that to the extent that you can keep alternative vehicles on your lot that fall within your brand identity. Uh, it makes the success rate of free agency stocking a bit more certain. But I think you can all appreciate that even if you were that Jaguar dealer, uh, there are a lot of late model uh, import luxury cars that are red hot beyond Jaguar. I'm not even sure if Jaguar would be hot, but there are certainly other ones. And I, uh, one that comes to mind that I often see is one of the better used cars in terms of market demand in the, in the marketplace is Infiniti. So could a Jaguar dealer sell you know, the right used Infiniti off their lot with a high degree of success? The answer is absolutely yes. But in the past, you know, that Jaguar dealer might have been you know, fairly limited if they were trying to do it the old way of taking cars in 
you know, that were primarily Jaguars or, um, or just cars that they've had past sales success with. So again, subject to those two practical limitations, um, you know, you can do this. So when I look at this list, step one for, for free agency is to expand the consideration list beyond those vehicles that they sell, beyond those, you know, historically or by franchise immediately I sort of discount these Hondas and Toyotas. Also, I'll tell you this, another reason why I would not want to try and attempt to prove to you I could buy these cars for the right money is that, you know, the perception on most used car buyers is that Hondas and Toyotas are hot. Whether they have any sort of sophisticated technology or not, that's just a very common perception. So it's highly likely that a lot of used car managers would put their hands high and long in the air if one of these cars came by them. So what I'm going to do here is expand the list as I have to a list to encompass vehicles beyond what this dealership sells new, beyond that which they've had sales history with, and here it is. Step one, but what's really important to understand in step one of free agency where you expand the consideration list is that they all must possess that very special quality of high demand, low supply, or put another way, low market day supply. That's the imperative of step one. You expand the list, but they must all have that special quality of low market day supply. Now step two, as I previously alluded to, is one that is somewhat counterintuitive. And that is that I want to pick the vehicles off of this list that most surprised me as uh, one familiar with the northern Michigan market. So, you know, I would say possibly um, the Dodges on, on this vehicle would, would be of such type of vehicle. Maybe the Chrysler 300M, uh, maybe the Sebring. I mean, for crying out loud, I just would not have guessed that a Chrysler Sebring, which I would perceive to be sort of a convertible type car, might be hot, but yet here it is on this list. Another vehicle that I uh, spotted when Sue read this list to me was that Chevy Malibu. Sue, what, tell me about that car. Uh, we have a 2010 Chevrolet Malibu. 2010 Chevrolet Malibu. Now, why is that car on the list? What's its overall market day supply? 78. 78. Now, that begins to approach the mid-80s of their inventory. It's still, if I could source that vehicle, it would still reduce their overall market day supply average slightly but it's still kind of up there high. But I'll show you something very fascinating. Would it be fair to say that all 010 Chevy Malibus are the same? And the answer is absolutely not. And, and let me show you why. If we drill down at this car, is it not the case, Sue, that we can see one particular model trim level of 010 Chevy Malibus in that market to be particularly high in demand and low in supply? Yes, there is. Tell me about that. It is the LT, the 2010 LTZ. The 2010 LTZ, why? Tell me about that one. It has uh, currently available 10, uh -huh. uh, sold in the last 45 days, 13, uh -huh. with a really outstanding 35-day market supply. Well, look at that. While 010 Chevy Malibus in totality of all their trims have a only marginally respectable 78-day supply. When you drill down on it and look at the particular models, you can see the LTZ is hot. Is there one in there that you definitely would not want to? Uh, yes, that would be the LS. Why is that? It has a 95-day supply. Look at that difference. I mean, do you all appreciate the value of being able to see that? I mean, that's kind of like getting the answers to the test before you go in. And if you were not a Chevy dealer, what would be the odds of you knowing that the LTZ in your market is the one you really want and not the LS? I mean, you know, that's, that's another reason why free agency has not been a viable strategy for dealers because if you start to experiment outside that box of familiarity that you may have of your own brand and a couple of very closely related ones, it's really risky out there. You know, we've all had that gotcha experience of going out and buying cars that we understood to be hot, only to have that unpleasant surprise when you brought it back and showed it for the first couple times that, you know, oh, my God, I didn't know it had to have fill in the blank, a certain trim or, you know, navigation or rear air conditioning or rear entertainment. I mean, we've all had those experiences, and those are costly experiences. And you don't have to be snake bitten much more than once or twice before you say no more. 
you know, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stick very close to home. But with technology as it is today, you know, you can go a long way to mitigating those risks. I wouldn't tell you that you could completely avoid them uh, because I don't think you can, but, you know, doing it smartly like we're doing it here today, you can avoid a lot of risk in this case of having made the mistakes of buying the 010 Chevy Malibu LS if you're a dealer in northern Michigan, in fact, is the LTZ. So, you know, I ask you this question. Do you think that every used car manager in town right now in northern Michigan knows and consequently out looking for 010 Malibu LTZs at the exclusion of 010 Malibu LSs? I think not, or at least not so much. So therein lies the purpose and, and, and the importance of step two of free agency, and that is really finding what I call the fringe cars, the cars that are hot in the market really hot, defined by high demand, short supply, but not quite so well understood by your competitors. And I want to tell you that when you have specialized knowledge about your market, and that knowledge is not commonly shared among all of your competitors, if you can act on that knowledge, that's the true definition of advantage. And that's exactly what we're doing here. So Susan, what I'd like you to do now to transition us from step two to step three of free agency is let's drop this LTZ on their buy list. And as we drop it on their buy list, let's further be sure that this vehicle actually is available at auction, and if so, where and in what quantity, before I show you, or at least attempt to show you, that I can probably buy it for the right money. So Susan, can we see this vehicle being available at other auctions, or any auctions? Uh, yes, Odessa uh, has 34 of them like mine, which means the LTZ. Great. Open Lane has one, CFAA has three, so there's, there's a good handful out there. Great, okay. So we can see that, you know, what I just did, you know, sitting in my office in Chicago, is I just looked into this northern Michigan market. I think you'd all agree with me that I identified a vehicle that this dealership, uh, you know, fits a particular segment of this dealership's inventory where arguably they're light that's intermediate cars, 15 to 20,000. I just showed you that I could look into that market, find at least one, and I could repeat this process over and over and find many more, but I found an 010 Chevy Malibu LTZ that is very hot in this market. Can I tell you necessarily why it's hot? No, but do I necessarily need to know? I'm not sure that I do. And I have demonstrated thus far that the vehicle can likely be sourced at auction. At least it is available. But what I've not yet demonstrated is that I could buy it for the right money. So now we're going to transition to that step, which is step three. And as you may recall, step three of free agency is to determine differently, and I would argue better, what you can afford to pay for this vehicle. So we're going to go ahead and drop this into uh, Bill Marsh's appraisal tool. And I'm going to demonstrate how to determine differently and better what you can afford to pay for the vehicle. But first, before I show you how to do it differently, I always want to look at the value of this car through the lens of my competitors. Now, depending on where you're located in the country, most used car operators will determine the wholesale value of a vehicle through a certain auction guide that might be part of their uh, wholesale culture. You know, and, and that might vary across the country depending on, on, you know, where you are. It could be NADA, it could be Kelly, it could be Black Book, it could be Gallops. And often they'll bounce it against, you know, auction data. So the first thing I want to do is get a sort of perspective on what my competitors who might be looking for this vehicle would likely bid for the car before I show you or determine what I'll bid for the car. So, Susan, these guys being in northern Michigan would likely use Black Book. So get me a black book average on this car. Get me a black book clean, please. Okay, average wholesale on this vehicle is fifteen nine. Fifteen nine, so it's called sixteen grand. Okay, and what's clean? Clean is seventeen four. Seventeen four. Okay, so I mean, I I think that we could all agree that real money on this vehicle. If somebody were to be looking for this vehicle, you know, in today's market, you know, might pay up to seventeen grand of real money. So let's just sort of make a mental note that if you're looking for this vehicle and to the extent your competitors are looking for it, you know, they would likely bid uh, up to 17 grand of real money. Now let me show you the way that I'll determine better how 
much I can pay for this vehicle. I'm going to open up a book that the auto publishes. They publish it in every market every 10 seconds. It's called R Book. It stands for Real Time Book. And what's important here is that you follow the process that we use to determine what the dealership should pay for this vehicle using the Real Time Book. So, Susan, if I were to own this vehicle in northern Michigan, how many competitors would I have? Well, currently only one, and that's because their distance is set at 100 miles. So we're going to bump it up to 150 to get a more accurate reading of what's out there. And right now we have eight competing, eight other vehicle, eight vehicles in the market. What's the average retail asking price of those eight vehicles in that market right now? 20,243. 20,002. Okay, now, everyone, follow carefully the process that I'm going to use to deduce what I can pay for the vehicle. The first question that I need to answer is this. How much money would it cost me to acquire this car at the auction in terms of fees, expenses, including transportation, and reconditioning? So I'm going to make up a number that I think is fairly realistic. I'm going to say $1,250. i am going to say between what it would take to recondition in 010 Malibu uh, buy it and, and ship it at the auction, you know, uh, transportation and auction fees, you know, I'm going to say is probably, you know, three four $400. So let's put in $1,250 estimated total cost to the front line. Okay. Now, the next question that I need to answer to determine differently what I can pay for this vehicle is this, and, and listen very carefully. What would be the least amount of front-end gross profit I would need to make at my dealership before I would say, why did I even bother with this car? It's not my target. It's not the optimal. It's the least. If I made less than X, I would be disappointed that I had even bothered. So what I'm going to do is take the liberties to say that that number would be a grand. So I'm going to plug in a grand. Now, the next step is something I, I already know the answer to, but I would suggest to you that none of you should be buying or trading for cars anywhere without considering this. How hot or not is this car in this market right now? So we can see here that the average market day supply, like mine, that's the LTZ model, the 010 Malibu, is what, Susan? 35. 35. 35. Now, remember what the average market day supply of, of Marsh's overall inventory was? I believe it was 86. So do you realize and appreciate what a win I'm going to produce for the inventory of this dealership if I can buy and stock, you know, one or two or three of these? So, okay, I've got a very hot car in my hands. Now, here comes the big money question. Here comes the big question that you need to answer next. If we end up owning this car at Marsh in northern Michigan, there will now be nine of us competing against each other in a 150-mile radius with exactly the same car. Knowing that this is a very hot car, a low market day supply car, where would I need to price it considering its price and mileage in order to be in and out of the vehicle in 40 days, as a velocity dealer must? Well, if the car didn't have a low day supply, if it had a high day supply, let's say not 35 but 135, where would I need to be priced on that car? Probably number one or two. But this car having a very low market day supply, I still don't want to be priced at seven or eight, but I don't need to be one or two either. However, I am very conservative. I mean, I do not want to overpay for a vehicle. I do not want to have myself in a position where I own a car for too much that I can't afford to price it where it needs to be priced. So I'm going to be very conservative. I'm going to say that I would need to be the fourth best vehicle in terms of price and mileage, what the auto users know as a V-rank. So plug in my exit position of number four in the market out of nine, Susan, and how much can I afford to pay for the car? $17,689. $17,689, close to seventeen seven. And remember what I just stated, and I think most of you would agree with me based on Black Book, which clean was fifteen nine, and and I'm sorry, average was fifty nine, and clean was about seventeen grand or a little bit above. We said that probably my competitors would be looking at paying about seventeen grand for this car. Well, in fact, I could pay as high as seventeen six. I can spend twelve fifty to auction fee it and transport it, recondition it, and have a $1,000 profit being fourth best in the market. So did I just prove 
that I could buy one of the hottest used cars right now in northern Michigan in a segment and price class category that this dealership probably can use for the right money? I think I just did that. Let's even assume that I want to be more conservative. Let's say that I wanted to be number three. If I wanted to be the third best value for this vehicle in the market with its low market day supply of 35 days, how much could I afford to pay for the car then? 17632 So very little less. But you see, most of my competitors looking at their black book, looking at their auction data, would probably say, you know, I really wouldn't justify or wouldn't want to go more than seventeen grand. But I know something about this market that my competitors don't. I understand something about its supply and its demand. I understand something about my competition. I understand something about my dealership's inventory that they don't, and that's what just allows me to justify paying more. You see, this notion that a car is worth the same to every dealer is absolutely nonsensical. You know, to me as an investor, one stock might be worth more or less to me depending on what my investment objectives are. If I'm a very, you know, liberal investor wanting to get big returns, I might be able to justify paying one thing, but if I'm a very conservative investor, I might be able to justify another. Well, the same sort of analogy holds true for every one of you depending on whether you need the car, depending on the market day supply of the car, depending on your competition. So this is, in fact, the best way to know um, how to get in a car. In short, it's knowing first how to get out of a car. And Susan, if I needed to price that thing at number three in order to pull off this exit strategy, where would I have to price that car? Uh, you'd be pricing that car at $19,882. $19,882, I'd be the third best price in the market, which I'm not sure I'd even have to do that, but at a worst case scenario, I'm confident I could get out there, and I would still have a grand profit left over. So again, let's just take a step back and review. What did I do in free agency stocking? I just stepped you through the, the three-step process. Number one, I was able to expand the list of vehicles that I would consider for stocking beyond that which my franchise represents, beyond that which represents my past sales history, but importantly to include that very special quality of low market day supply. In other words, high demand, short supply. Number two, I didn't pick cars off this list that I'm sure had I done, they would have given me a different outcome on step three. If I had chosen the Toyota Camry or Honda Accord off this list, I can almost assure you that I would have proven that I could not buy that car for the right money. And the reason being, because most every other used car manager is also out trying to buy that car. But I had specialized knowledge. I knew something that my competitors in mass do not know, and I'm able to act on it. So that second step was very important. I'm able to pick the cars off that are hot, but on the fringe of familiarity among my competitors. And then step number three, I used a very different method to arrive what I could pay for this car. And it's basically, you know, what I would refer to as sort of a top-down, a retail-down. Because if I'm going to retail this car, the best way of knowing how to get in is first knowing how to get out. And then you back out your cost, you back out your reconditioning, and your um, target, you know, minimum uh, expected profit objective. And that tells you what you can pay for the car. So if you use these three steps, you'll often get to this result. But think about it. You know, it took some time to do it. And not all the time you run down all these alleys where you get the result that you're looking for. Very often you'll get to step three. Not very often, but often enough for many to be discouraged. You'll get to step three and you'll say, oop, I can't buy that car for the right money. So, um, you know, that's why it, it just won't be widely adopted because this takes time. But I will tell you this. That from my experience, and I've got plenty of experience now seeing dealers pull this strategy off successfully, I really don't think that this work that we just went through has to be done by a very busy, very high paid used car manager. Certainly it needs to be done under the auspices of somebody who's got the used car manager or general manager or owner experience and judgment, but I think that every one of you has someone in the dealership that is very bright is very data analytic computer literate 
And I think that if you set out the guidelines for them, you gave them the tool, you gave them training, and you gave them guidelines, you could say, okay, you go do this, you go produce the buy list for me, bring it to me for approval. And if you were to set the boundaries, so to speak, paint the lines on the field for this individual, say, okay, I want cars that bring down my overall market day supply in my inventory. I want cars that have a minimum profit objective of a grand, you know, figuring X amount of reconditioning and, and purchasing costs. I want them in the certain segments that the tool shows me that I'm light in, that the market is still very hot for. And if you set those parameters, let them do the legwork. Um, it does not have to be done by a very high paid, expensive, busy owner, GM, or used car manager. To a certain extent, it's, I don't want to call it grunt work because it's very important, but it's, 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 it's legwork. But it's not legwork that has to be done by someone who's got you know, 30 years of experience in the market. I want that person blessing it for sure before I go out and pull the trigger. And I also want to make a point that I wouldn't go out based on what we just did on this particular LTZ Malibu and go out and buy two truckloads of them. I'd buy one or two or three and experiment with them. And if I had good success with those, then I'd go out and buy more. So, you know, what I've shown you here is that it can be done. I do this sort of demonstration literally every day somewhere in the market. You know, and I, I do my, my, you know, blind guy routine. I say, would you like to see how a blind guy could fly in here from Chicago, instantly identify the hottest used vehicles in your market, and likely prove that I could buy them for the right money. So I know this works. I've seen many of dealers who are doing it today, and it works. But it's not, to be sure, the traditional happenstance way of doing it. But if you're willing to invest this time to do it up front, not only, as I've demonstrated, can you buy the right cars for the right money for your store, but you'll start selling cars that you never would have sold before because you never would have stocked them before. So to get those two benefits from the free agency uh, engineered inventory method of stocking, I would suggest to you is well worth it. So what I'd like to do now with the remaining time is I'd like to turn it back to you guys, you know, answer any questions that I can about this or anything else that might be on your mind. Okay, um, well, we have about ooh, eight minutes to 12 here, but we still have a full house of people on, so I think we're good with the questions. And I also will, will tell you that I will continue to uh, go through um, until I've answered all the questions, even if it goes after the hour, and obviously anyone who needs to depart, um, you're certainly free to do that. Okay, so our first question comes from an Anthony Reich, or Rich, I'm not positive, I apologize for your name. Um, he asks, are you going to be able to email us the presentation slides, or do I need to take notes? Um, I'd be happy to email you the presentation slide. Uh, before we finish, if not already, I'll put up my email address. Just email me the request. Just put in the subject line, you know, presentation slides, and I will certainly be happy to get these to you. Just keep in mind that, that the, the real meat of what I've done, I, I've done live. Um, and, and that won't email, but if it's something that you're not familiar with and you'd like to see another live demonstration, I'll get one of my guys to do that as well. Okay, next question comes from Russ Wallace. <laughs> hey, Russ. He says, wholesale units are filtered out by status and are not included in retail sites. The wholesale button includes the new liquidator lot. Okay, so what you're, I think what you're suggesting to me, Russ, is that your turn is actually better than 15.5. Thank you. Uh, Russ, you're a master. Uh, from a Jamie Martin, what makes up the total investment number? Total investment number makes up your total inventory. And as Russ just alluded to uh, within this tool, and I'm sure others as well, you have the ability to, um, uh, to filter that by retail or wholesale or both. Okay, the next question comes from Frank, I'm sorry, Fred Peruzzi. What is the monthly volume, and is it for all stores? What is the monthly volume, and is it for all stores? So, Russ, I'm going to let you reply to that, if, if you would, and, uh, you know, and, and I'll let you speak for yourself on that. So we'll come back to that in, in just a moment, if Russ is still on. Um, but what I just demonstrated to you, or demonstrated for you here, was, in fact, at an enterprise level across five stores. You could have equally have done this store by store. And I might also add that uh, of all the dealers that I've had the privilege of working with, Russ and his organization 
do inventory stocking perhaps as good or better than anyone that I've seen. And, and they actually have a whole other level of analysis that they do beyond this level. So um, I don't want to inundate Russ, uh, but um, I, I, as I often say, everyone who stocks a lot should know Russ Walls. Okay, and Russ Wallace came back and said 200 units, all stores. 200 units, all stores, retail. Okay, which may go to answer the next question, which is, do they have, do they only have 120 vehicles at the five stores combined, or is this one store? Uh, this is the enterprise level that I've shown you. Okay. You know, I, I often are the times that dealers, you know, will say to me, if I'm going to sell you know, 100 cars, I have to have 125 or 150. It's absolutely nonsense. These guys will sell 100 used, car, 100 used cars a month, you know, with a 75 car inventory. And uh, he's not alone in doing that, but that is, in fact, uh, what, you know, really efficient operators such as Russ are capable of doing. And from Rob Davis, how do you determine the demand and margin information in a market? Yeah, good question. Um, because we're able to see all the vehicles in the market, we see them when they, they come and they go. We time and date stamp every vehicle in the market. We time and date stamp when it arrives for sale in the market. We time and date stamp every time it has a price change. We time and date stamp when it gets sold. And we can ferret out the retails and the wholesales. So with that information updated every 10 seconds in our database, we can quantify supply and demand of any vehicle in any market at any moment with its exact equipment combination. Okay, next question comes from Brian Benstock. He says, hello. <laughs> There's another master of turd. Hey, Brian, number one Honda certified dealer in the world. Thanks, Brian. Okay, from Jamie Martin, when you say 214 at all auctions, what is considered all auctions? Well, that's a good question, uh, Jamie. Thank you. Uh, it really isn't all auctions. It's all auctions that we presently have the ability to monitor. And most notably missing, and it is a big notable, is the Mannheim organization. But um, um, uh, since our recent acquisition by Auto Trader, um, it, it will be likely not prepared to commit to it, but be very likely that I'll soon have uh, the, the Mannheim data available in this as well. You also, as a V Auto dealer, have the ability to set the radius of auctions that you want to consider buying from uh, in, in the tool to show you. You could say the whole country. And, and, you know, I would say to you that in today's very tight wholesale supply market, you do need to go further to be sure to buy the cars that you need for the right money. So if you're not already very familiar and adept with the online buying tools, I would encourage you to uh, become so. And I believe you just answered Jamie's next question, what is considered your market and can it be expanded and contracted? Yes, yes and yes. Okay, uh, this comes from Ryan Goldenberg. On the investment summary, what is the average wholesale score chart? Our V Auto doesn't show that trend. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Ryan, uh, here's another true technician of, of used car inventory management. Ryan is the uh, inventory guru along with Andrew Walzer, the Walzer Automotive Group in Minneapolis. And, and these guys, like uh, Russ Wallace, take this thing to a level of science that few do. Um, Ryan, this is, this is a, a, a discussion that I'll have with you offline, but basically the wholesale score is a legacy data point from the earliest iterations of my software which was not even called the auto, it was called Empower Auto. And it allows a dealer, if you choose to, I can turn that on for you, to score your cars against um, the wholesale marketplace. And when I later evolved the technology of, of quantifying supply and demand in the retail market, I sort of let loose of the wholesale um, uh, benchmark in favor of the retail for a lot of reasons, but I also had some dealers that were on early with me, such as Bill Marsh and others, that uh, kind of got hooked on that score and still use it. So if it's something you want to pursue, I'd be happy to have that discussion with you. Thank you. Okay, and from a Steve Roop, how do I pick the correct engine for the, 10, the 2010 Malibu LTZ? Well, interestingly, uh, Steve, thank you for that question. You have the ability, Susan, if, if you could pull that car back up, Mm -hmm. 
you could click on or off the different engines and see what effect that has on the vehicle supplying its demand. Um, is, should I take another question while you do that, Sue? Or oh, no, we're up. We're up. We're okay. Show, show Steve how, and others how that works. Okay, so with the LTZ, with the R book, and we changed it to a four-cylinder, it just changed our like mine day supply to 51. Okay, so that car actually does better with the six-cylinder. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So uh, once again, do you guys appreciate the value of knowing that? I mean, honest to God, that gets me more excited than most anything else. I mean, your ability to know which car, which model, which engine, which transmission, which trim is actually the right one goes a long way to taking the risk out of free agency and goes a long way to putting cars on your lot that truly, in fact, are the cars that your market wants. Okay, um, let's see, from a Tim Felsky, he says, plans to expand in Canada. Yeah, Tim, uh, we will uh, be in Canada early next year. Um, I am not at liberty to disclose the details on it, but suffice it to say, uh, we're going to be there in a big way. I just saw yesterday for the first time the V Auto application in French. So you know we're right around the corner, my friend. And send me an email, and I'm keeping a database of Canadian dealers that have expressed early interest. But there'll be a major announcement in the Canadian market right after the first of the year. Thank you. Okay, and there was a question from Chad Tessman. Hey, Chad. Dale, uh, Dale, what is the V Auto Network? I saw it on the buy list. Yeah, um, you know. In the tight wholesale marketplace, I'm, you know, I'm thinking of ways to, you know, help you guys out. And one of the things that I did is I created a network that will allow you guys, if you choose to opt in, to see each other's inventories and and do it in a way that's sort of, you know, appropriate where you're not looking at each other's costs. But if you're looking for certain vehicles, you can search the V Auto network and you know, maybe do some business among yourselves. And there's no uh, no charge for that. It's just, you know, something that we thought was smart to do for you. So if that's something that you're interested in learning more about, um, you know, I can have your performance manager contact you. So if you would make a note on that. Sure. Uh, next, uh, next call or next question from Anthony Rich. Uh, what is the ideal or right market day supply for inventory? Yeah, um, you know, my my uh, sort of benchmark um, is that any car that you can find in your market with a market day supply of 60 days or less is a very fortunate car. Between 60 and 90, I consider it to be sort of mid-range. And above, my, above 90 are cars that if you can't avoid owning, you'd want to. Now, obviously, you cannot always avoid owning those cars. People inevitably are going to trade them in, and that's okay. But what's important to know is that it is such a vehicle when it is being traded. You know, it might be a car that just wouldn't be the wisest thing to do to stretch to the moon. And or when you have possession of such a vehicle, you know, generally speaking, it's not a car that you want to spend the first 30 days trying to hit a home run on because if the car's got high supply and low demand, the odds of hitting that home run in the first 30 days are pretty slim. Not impossible, but pretty slim. So when you have high market day supply vehicles and inventory, recognize them as a car that has a certain impairment and, and you know, be very aggressive on day one. Okay, next question comes from Bill Simmons. Will there be a recorded version of today's webinar available? Yes, so you hit the record button? <laughs> I, I did hit the record button. All right, yes, there will. We'll have it on our website um, um, early next week. Right. Thank you. Okay, uh, from Ryan Walters, uh, and again, same question, what is the optimal market day supply for our inventory? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, that you, um, you, you heard my previous answer. I mean, I, realistically, uh, you know, I'll never see a dealer that's got a lot full of cars in the 60 or below. Individual cars, yes. Strive to buy cars in that zero to 60 market day supply, of course. But realistically, you know, most dealers will be, you know, in the 70s or 80s. Uh, but, you know, I see a fair amount of dealers that have market day supplies of their inventories, you know, 90 and above. And when you've got that sort of situation, you see tomorrow's sales are a lagging indicator of today's inventory market day supply. 
So to the extent that you can reduce that, uh, you're going to have more success in terms of both volume and gross tomorrow. Okay, next question comes from Phil McDonald. He says, now that you have a partnership with Cox Enterprises, when can we expect Mannheim integration on V-Auto? Yeah, you know, I can't speak for Mannheim, but what I can tell you is that I've had very productive conversations with them in the past several weeks, and I expect to have, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful, let me put it that way, to have, you know, um, access to their data early next year. But, you know, they're, they're an independent company owned by Cox, but it, it certainly helps. Okay, next question comes from Tony Cuomo. I noticed, I noticed 47 vehicles don't have descriptions. We have almost all vehicles with descriptions and price right to market, but not getting results. What do you say about that, Mr. Walsh? <laughs> I'll, I'll let him take that. <laughs> if, if I had to guess, knowing Russ, there are 47 cars that have come in, in the last six hours, but I'll, uh, I'll let Russ come back with that if he wants to. Okay, uh, from Brian Benstock. How do we take our current level of business and double it? Uh, you know, that's a loaded question, and I just have to tell you, there's no one who should be asking that question. This guy, Benstock, ought to be uh, saying the answer. And Brian, tell me, um, uh, all kidding aside, and, and not in an attempt to be commercial, but I know that uh, your volume uh, and production really went up when you hired you hired a marketing company. Um, uh, and if you could write in to me the name of that company, I sure wouldn't mind giving them a plug because um, they absolutely did some really innovative things for you. And, and, and Brian is just another one of those guys that I will look to always to understand, you know, how to get more done with less. Uh, but Brian, if you could help me, what was the name of that company that you hired? I'd, I'd like to do that. But you know, Brian's a guy who's demonstrated the ability of, of just saying there's no limit to what we can do here. Okay, and from Randall West, I had to step out and missed which button shows me the buy list. Uh, which button shows me the buy list? Sue, can you demonstrate? Uh, yes, I can. On, on your main page under, under the menu items bar, if you click on stocking, if you want to go directly to the buy list, you can just go down and click on buy list. It'll bring your buy list page up for you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, let's see, uh, also from Ryan Walters, is there an average market day supply for all your dealers? Uh, um, yeah, you know, Ryan, we have, I'm not sure if you're a Viato user or not, but I, another thing that I created, um, um, and, and every Viato dealer has it no charge, is what I call the knowledge network. Because again, I think that you guys have so much learning um, in, in your own stores that for you guys not to share some of those data points in aggregate is really a shame. So Sue, is, is the Knowledge Network uh, on this store capable of showing us what the average market day supply is? And you could look at it for dealerships of your brand. You could look at it for top performing dealers. You could even set up your own peer group if you got a bunch of buddies or 20 group dealers. Uh, we are looking at day supply. Yep. Uh, yeah, it is set up for this one. Okay, what is that? What are those numbers? Okay, so let's see. For Bill Marsh, he is looking at uh, 8411, 91.24 for all dealers, which is the green bar for those of you watching. Oh, and maybe I need to switch my screen. Hold on. I need to make sure we're on the right screen here. Um, so you can see this green bar here. This is all dealers. So you can see here it's showing 76.94 in the 16 to 30 day bucket. It's showing uh, 78.64 days in the 31 to 45 day bucket. Um, you can see our V-Auto top performers, they are the, the light yellow line. Uh, they are currently showing, let's see, 73.29 in the 16 to 30 day bucket, 80.89 in the 31 to 45 day bucket. So the information is there, yes. So, and, and you see, it's no surprise that as the vehicles age, the market day supplies will almost invariably go up because you guys understand what happens just naturally. You know, those cars that have higher demand, lower supply are like the cream that gets skimmed off the top and you get left with sort of the residue, the, the higher market day supply cars left. So, you know, suffice it to say, you know, when you guys think about what cars to stock for inventory, the only thing you're ultimately concerned about is how fast that car is likely to sell, how easy it will make growth. 
Well, the, the single, and I'm not saying it's the only, I'm just saying the single most relevant point you could possibly know to accurately predict how fast and how much is not the brand of the car, is not your dealership's past sales history with that type of car, not how pretty or ugly the car is, but rather its relationship of its supply and its demand. When you guys have cars with high demand and short supply, on average, over time, those cars are going to sell faster and make gross easier than cars with lower day supply or higher day supply cars. So, you know, it's really a big disconnect in the industry that dealers today will buy tens of millions of used cars for stock, caring about how fast and how much, and so many of them will give almost no, if any, attention at all to what's the market day supply of the inventory. I say to you that while it's not the only thing that matters, it's got to be one of, if not the single most relevant thing you guys really ought to know when you think about what cars you want to own for stock, and for that matter, how far you'll be willing to stretch to own them, and how proud you're going to be of them when you go to price them. Next, Sue. Okay, next question comes from, comes from Joe Tureen. Now that you have a strategic alliance with AutoTrader, are you planning on showing stats on specific vehicles viewed by customers in specific areas to help with the free agency assessment? Oh, my God. You guys just wait to see what I'm going to do. i got to tell you, I have not been so excited about what I've been doing in a long, long time because I have the keys to the data kingdom, and I'm already beginning to work with it. Um, AutoTrader has sent me for, for six months this ginormous file that contains every click that every user made in a six-month period, and you know what kind of gold is in those hills? and I'm, I know what to do with that data. I mean, I'm going to be able to show you the cars in every one of your markets that are being searched most often. I'm going to be able to show you at what price points. I'm going to be able to show you what alternative cars they tend to search for as a second or third choice. I mean, i got to tell you, your question puts its finger exactly on the promise of the benefit of this acquisition. And, and that's why I wanted the company to go to AutoTrader, because they had that stuff and they were willing to give it to me. And what I'm going to do for you guys in terms of inventory management with that data, I promise you, will take the art and science to a whole other level. So I, I really appreciate the question. And, uh, and, you know, we're just beginning to work with this data right now. It's, it's, it's just overwhelming how much is there and, and, and trying to figure out what it means and be able to test its reliability is, is going to be a pretty big effort. But, um, you know, this is what's going to come into the tool for sure uh, this coming year. Okay. Brian Benstock came back and said I, his marketing firm is tier10marketing.com. Yeah. Th this, this guy who owns that company, uh, Tier 10 Marketing, um, is a guy named Sean Wolfington, and, and without a doubt, he's he's one of the master minds of, of automotive marketing that I've ever come to know. And I don't have any, I, 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 don't, I don't know that I've even ever met Sean in person, so I don't have any personal or financial connection or relation to, to him, but the, the, the guy is brilliant. That's all I can tell you on that. Okay, and we have two people asking this next question. One is Gary Seneca, the other is Brian Benstock. What is Transfer Advantage? Yeah, Transfer Advantage, again, is something that I created in V-Auto. It's available to everyone. Um, if, if you have more than one store uh, in V-Auto, and, and there's no charge for it, if you have more than one store, you can have us turn on this feature called Transfer Advantage. And what it does is it shows you for your network of, of stores that you own, if, if there's any car in any one of those markets that has a higher average selling price or a lower market day supply in your inventory and exactly what that advantage is in terms of dollars or days. And, uh, you know, if, if you guys are, are part of a multiple chain and you're in different markets where you're likely to have different market day supplies and, and average price points, you know, it, it can be a valuable tool to see where potentially a car might go to optimize its uh, potential. Next question comes from Kevin Berger. Have you found the same success for metro versus non-metro stores? Do you think turn rate should be the same for metro versus non-metro? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, well, let me tell you, I think there was a day in our business where you were big time advantaged being a metro dealer versus a rural dealer. I happen to believe today you're probably much advantaged being a rural dealer over a metro dealer, but that's sort of a, a different discussion. But but the function of turn, I can show you dealers in the most remote parts of the country, and I can show you the Brian Benstocks of the world in the most populous uh, places and densest places.
places in the country and you know have the best turn or the worst turn. There is no function of 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 size of market to turn. You know, it, it, it has to do with, with the discipline that you have about stocking your lot appropriately to the sales that you're making and, and being willing to adjust it. The next question comes from Woody Butts. Hey, Woody, how are you? How are those trailers going, my friend? <laughs> Here, here's the entrepreneur of all car dealers. <laughs> I hate to tell you, Woody finds ways to make money that most of us would never think of. And Woody asks, what is the name of Russ's dealership group? Uh, it's the Bill Marsh Group. It's out of Traverse City, Michigan. And, I, and I'm telling you guys, and I could, I could do a whole seminar on just some of the things that this dealership group does that are just so brilliant that I've yet to see replicated anywhere, although some of you have gone there and are looking at it. but. Uh, the Bill Marsh Group. And, and, and I also want to tell you, nicer people you'll never meet. Next question comes from Jeffrey Wynn. Position on retailing all trades. Do you wholesale out of trades with high day supply, trades that don't fit the engineered inventory? Well, you know what? Um, I, I want to tell you something. Uh, Bill Pearson of Finish Line Ford in Peoria, Illinois, which is an extraordinary success, um, will tell you he doesn't care what the market day supply is. But when he goes and buys cars that have high market day supplies, and he does plenty of them, he'll go out purposely and buy those cars. But what he will tell you he's doing is he's buying that car with an expectation. I know this is going to you know, shock you guys and put half of you in cardiac arrest, but he'll buy those cars with an expectation of losing money on the front end. He knows he's going to lose $100 or $200 or $300, but you know what? He'll lose that money after you know, or, or before he puts the car through the shop, he'll put an F and I customer in the office on one of those cars. So, you know, would I recommend that as a mainstream strategy? No, but uh, the point is, if you have a high market day supply car, what you better be prepared for is to price that car super aggressively from day one. And if you're not willing to do that, then you ought to wholesale it. Uh, but if you are willing to do it, you know, th there's no such thing as a bad car. There's just a bad price for a car. But to the extent that you can, you know, engineer a lot full of cars that have lower market day supplies, you know, you guys will find much more sort of natural success. Next question comes from Steve Gerhardt. I do not see book values in my enterprise level buy list analysis or settings. Is this something tech support needs to turn on? Thanks and happy holidays. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, I, don't, I don't know that book values uh, show up at the enterprise level. Um, I'm not positive about that, but uh, that would be a good question for the performance manager. Um, it, it might, the book values might just be, at, I, in fact, I think that's probably the case at the dealership level because you know, different dealerships within an enterprise might use different books. So I, I think that's probably a dealership level value. Okay. From Chad Tussman, Dale, we have a good day supply, 71. Low average cost, 93%. Low average cost of $10,765, I'm guessing, per unit. Turnaround is nine and has been for a while. We follow most of these processes and suggestions. Uh, does not have to, oh, uh, Chad says you don't have to answer him now. He could be by email at a later time. Uh, Chad, let me let me spend some time with you offline, and I'd be willing to do that with any of you because you know if if you've got sort of the right metrics and you're having you know trouble getting over that nine turns, uh, you know there are several different places that I'd like to look to see what's going on and possibly make some recommendations to you to to do some things differently that will uh, that will move you along. And I'm happy to spend time with you. Thank you. Okay, and uh, let's see, from Ted Cowell, do you have a written process available that describes your presentation of how to find and buy hottest cars at low at lowest prices? You know, I, I write on a blog called dalepollock.com, and I definitely, you know, through the past couple of years have written uh, plenty of, of material on this, so I would urge you to, to search through the literature that I've written that's posted at dalepollock.com. Um, also feel free to contribute there if you'd like. And if there is something more that you would like that I could help you with, uh, please send me an email and I'll be happy to help any way I can. 
Okay, and from Ryan Walters, Reno is a small market. The closest market to our city is 120 miles away. Should we use only our market for stocking, or should we use a 150-mile radius to stock our inventory? Um, I think that in Reno, I'd probably recommend that you use 150 miles. Um, you know, people will definitely travel uh, for the right cars at the right price. So I, I, would, I would recommend a 150-mile radius for sure there. Okay, and uh, next question comes from, also from, um, I'm sorry, from Bill Simmons. Uh, I'm sorry, from Raymond Kemmer. Is that engine based upon VIN explosion or as advertised online? No, it, it's both. Um, we obviously start with the VIN explosion, but then we, we not only take down every vehicle we see on the Internet, but every single word of every description, and then we normalize it. So you can well imagine there's only about a thousand different ways somebody can describe automatic transmission, auto tran, auto trans, auto hyphen, slash, backslash, you know, tran, tranny, and, and we are able to recognize all those different variations, standardize it to a standard description word, and, and categorize the cars that at a trim and equipment level, which you got to appreciate is really, really hard to do and really powerful when you do it. And from Bob Dunkelberger, any plans to track sales data per client for color, miles, year, make, or model? Yeah, I, you know what? Um, it's, it's easy to track sales data history. I personally am not a big fan of, of sales history just because you know, I made money on AT&T stock last quarter. Doesn't mean that I'm going to make AT&T money or money on that stock. See, what I really my, my fundamental problem with sales history is this: that what makes a car a good car today is a function of what you owned it for and what the market will allow you to sell it for. And 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 those you know what you buy them for and what you sell them for generally will will trend with a certain degree of correlation but it also has a very much of an accordion effect. So where I get, you know, it's not that, that history doesn't have relevance, but it will give you a lot of head fakes because you might have done really well, you know, with a certain car, uh, and I realize this doesn't exactly go to the question of color, but uh, certain cars you might have done very well with because of what the market would allow you to charge for them or what the market allowed you to buy it for, 30 days ago, which can be very different today, but yet the people think it's the same car, so it ought to have a similar track record, and in fact, it just doesn't work that neatly. So I, I'm scared of history as a, as a really, you know, act, I, I'm scared of history to put it in the application because I know the tendency on dealers is they want to rely on it so heavily, and quite frankly, I, I just, I, I hate to put it in there and make it really easy for you to see just for that reason. I've seen it give so many different wrong answers. And in fact, I'll tell you, if, if, anybody, if, if anybody tells me that they stock their lot based on their history and, and, and nothing else and have success with it, I'd like to meet them. Okay, next car, or next, I'm sorry, next question comes from Gabriel Cohen. If a car with average market day supply becomes aged and it is priced at 1 to 5 V rank, what would be the best exit strategy at 45 days? Yeah, that's a really good question. First of all, I, I think I would ask you to adjust your exit strategy time clock to day one. You know, what, what, I, what I really can't tell from your question is how that car was priced for the first 30 days or the first 10 or 15 days. And, and suffice it to say, you can't wait until you get to 30 or 45 to put the right price on it to make it sell because, you know, it will take a certain amount of time. So, you know, one of the things that I've really come to understand and respect in the past year and a half or so, and this is one of the reasons why I was so intent to, to align myself with Auto Trader, is that um, it, it's really interesting that, that car, the amount of action that a car will get on the Internet um, is, is very identifiable at different price points. Uh, based on how many clicks that car gets. So one of, the, one of the big pieces of gold that I hope to mine out of that data that I alluded to earlier is that there are, are points of inflection where you'd be surprised where just a hundred or $200 difference on the price of the car very significantly changes the rate of search results or VDP clicks on that car. And, and it's, it's not to be found necessarily just in a V rank 
or a percent of market. It's, it's really more granular than that. So, you know, I, I hope to bring you a whole other level of analysis on, on, you know, how these cars need to be priced. But again, I, I would ask you to think about, you know, the fact that age management on any car begins on age one. On those cars that have higher market day supplies, you've got to get more aggressive on more quickly. Cars with lower, just the opposite. So I don't know if I, if I exactly give you satisfaction on the answer of that question, but um, the best I can tell from the information you gave me is that, you know, you've got to start earlier on, on the age management psyche. Okay, from Rob Lee, what percent of purchases are bought online? Hey, Rob, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I don't know the answer. But, uh, you know, if, if you were in the seminar in the very beginning, it's pretty scary to me when, if it's true, if 64% of the consignment cars are purchased, you know, outside the United States, you know, I'm pretty sure most of all of those are online. So it, it, it's got to be high. But I'll also tell you this, Rob, that I... Um, I'm, I'm amazed at how long these online auction tools have been in existence and how little competency and expertise and comfort there is within the dealership to use them or to use them appropriately or to use them efficiently. Um, and, and I think that, you know, that's just because we had it so easy for so long we never really needed to. But I'm telling you guys today, it would take a lot of pressure off of yourselves if you were willing and able to go further from your home to buy cars, which almost by definition means that you're going to have to do it electronically. So, you know, I, I think that better use and understanding and training on those tools would, would go a long way for dealers to take pressure off themselves of buying cars right. Uh, from Russ Wallace, he says he's not sure why the descriptions aren't loading. They are directly from HomeNet. So he's not sure why they're not why they're showing as being missing. Okay, something that needs to be looked into. Obviously, thanks, Russ. Okay, from John Douglas, I tend to expand the radius when shorter uh, radius lends a small sample. Is this recommended? Yeah, it is recommended. Although you know, when you expand your radius, you have to recognize that you know possibly it, it's of less relevance. Um, also, let me tell you guys something. When you have to expand the radius to get a market day supply in a car. That means there's either few cars in the numerator or the denominator, the numerator being the current supply, the denominator of the market day supply calculation being the average daily retail sales rate over the past 45 days. So when you have a, when you have a problem or when the system gives you an NA, that means there's a deficiency of, of quantity of sample size in either the numerator or denominator. That generally denotes risk. I just want you guys to know that. If you cannot get you know, a market day supply in a car without expanding it, it either means there's not a lot of them out there, which is generally an indication of something, or there's not a lot of retail demand or both, which generally, not always, will denote a certain amount of risk. So unless you're in a very small market in which, and, and you find yourself constantly expanding the radius, um, it, it, uh, you might, step one, evaluate what's your default radius, and step two, you know, be on notice that when you're having to do that, on a car, it's probably a car that is not going to be a super easy car to retail. Okay, next question comes from Steve Sprung, and it looks like we have just a couple questions left here. When using our book for a vehicle, I am seeing a lot of vehicles with an option of turbocharged that are definitely not turbocharged, nor were they ever made available that way. Where does this info come, come yeah, from? Yeah, where that info comes from is that uh, there are cars being advertised on the Internet like that calling them turbocharged. And um, if you bring those to our attention, you know, and, and tell us that that car is not available with a turbocharge, I can eliminate that as an option. But when you see it there, the reason you see it is that there are guys out there advertising that car as a turbocharged car. So again, if, if you, you know, recognize something like that, bring it to our attention and we can put a rule in the back end that will, even though guys are calling it that, eliminate that as, as an option. Okay, from Steve Roop. Dale, thanks for your passion for our industry. Do you tap into Craigslist as a source to acquire inventory? You know, Craigslist has been an on and off again for us. Uh, the, the, there's lots of issues with Craigslist. Not the least of it is, is the messiness of the data. But there's also a lot of uh, legality stuff going around uh, with respect to, to Craigslist. And um, we're, we're reevaluating the whole Craigslist strategy. It's a little bit of a, um, 
you know, little bit of a, of a rough area. What we found is that most cars on Craigslist we can also see on other sites. Not all of them, to be sure, but most of them. So the fact that we may or may not have Craigslist in any given market, which I believe is the case right now, and some we do and some we don't, is, uh, does not necessarily mean that we don't have those cars in our database because most often, not always, we can find them on another site. Thank you for the question and, and the endorsement. Uh, next question comes from John Douglas. And when making price adjustments, should we adjust every time there is an alert or limit it to once a week, once weekly, in order to make sure we are right for the weekend? Yeah, good question. Thanks, John. You know, I would say depending on how tight you have your alert, you know, or, or your pricing uh, um, uh, plan set, you know, if, if they could be set very sensitive where it becomes burdenous. But let me just tell you this in general from my experience. Dealerships that adjust their prices most often uh, will tend to turn inventory more often. It, it, it's hard for me to ever say that giving that that you could give too much attention to pricing analysis and pricing changes. So you know, I would encourage you to put as much you know against it as your resources will allow you to do it. And uh, I, I guess that's the best I could recommend there. Okay, uh, from Chad Tussman. Dale, you have a DESA run list in the buy list. Does it include dealer block? If not, can that be changed? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, Chad. Sue, can you note that question? And, and Chad, let me see if I can get you an answer. Dealer block, okay. Okay, got it. Thank you. And last, uh, last I guess, statement, uh, also from Chad. Uh, also, mobile apps rock. Thank you for investing in your product. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I apologize that, that we had a little bit of a delay there because, you know, honest to God, it, it, we, we had to pick a horse. I mean, who are you going to develop? Whose platform? iPhone. At first we thought we were going to do smartphone, then we pulled back, we did iPhone, and then obviously Android came on strong and there's still BlackBerry out there. So what we eventually did is we just said, you know what, we're not going to go in 19 different directions. We stepped back, we damn near rewrote the whole V Auto application that took us a whole lot of time and effort to do, created some performance problems, I might add, which some of you experienced. Um, and um, uh, we have this thing written on a basis now where we can just crank stuff out to both iPhone and uh, in Android pretty much at will. You know, so, you know, we, we, we overhauled the engine that will allow it to go, you know, different speeds and different directions. So thank you for your patience. And that VIN scanner, I apologize, you guys. It was garbage when we came out with it, and uh, we heard you. We made it a high priority. We got the new VIN scanner out there. I think the feedback has been very good. And there's even things that we're continuing to do because we know we can and must make it better. So thanks for that. And uh, big, big emphasis on our part on mobile. We'll be making some really cool mobile announcements at, at um, at NADA this year, so we're definitely putting a lot of resources into mobile. I want to uh, I want to thank you guys. I really appreciate all the support that you've given me. I promise you, I'll take the new Auto Trader relationship and and make it a win for all of you. And um, I want to wish you guys a Merry Christmas. If I can follow up on anything for anyone, whether you do business with me or not, please feel free to call me or send me an email. And uh, just want to say thank you and, and happy safe holidays to all of you. Talk soon.